In 58 BC, a woman in the Egyptian capital of Alexandria was beheaded on orders from her father. 17 years later and hundreds of miles away, her younger sister would be slaughtered on the steps of the Temple of Artemis in Ephesus, on order from her sister. Their bodies were taken away to some dark graves and forgotten. They were the daughters of Ptolemy, sisters of Cleopatra. Usurpers, victors, victims, queens. But before all that, they were Berenice and Arsinoe. Let's talk about the Lost Fourths. It was the year 77 BC. The Ptolemaic dynasty was 228 years old and current ruler Ptolemy XII was welcoming the birth of a daughter by his wife Cleopatra V. They named her Berenice. She would soon be followed by sisters Cleopatra and Arsinoe, and two brothers, both named Ptolemy. There might have been an older sister as well, though we don't have the DNA evidence to prove it. Cleopatra Trephena certainly existed, but historians dispute if she was a daughter of Ptolemy or actually just Cleopatra V rebranded. Strabo, a contemporary historian of the time, insisted that Ptolemy only had three daughters, of whom only Berenice was legitimate, being the last child of Cleopatra V before her disappearance from record in 69 BC. The Ptolemies, on the whole, were a rather ambitious, treacherous bunch, seeking the throne and power over all, and it was this environment that Berenice and her siblings grew and eventually proved to thrive in. They were presumably raised in the Palace of Alexandria. Their education was presided over by Greek tutors, as their dynasty was, at its roots, Hellenistic in nature. The Ptolemies were heavily influenced by Greek ideas and culture, to the point that only one of the Ptolemy children, Cleopatra VII, even bothered to learn Egyptian. But they had over time adopted native customs, including stylizing themselves as pharaoh, worshipping Egyptian gods, and marrying their siblings. The first two make sense, but the last created dynastic disputes that, along with several wars, had weakened the kingdom over time. By Berenice's birth, it relied heavily on the Roman Republic to get by. Berenice was the inheritor of a dying dynasty, but she intended to bring it back to life. In 58 BC, following blunders that had lost him control over Cyprus, Ptolemy XII was driven both out of power and out of Egypt by his increasingly powerful daughter-slash-wife, Cleopatra VI, Trephena. He fled to Rome to ask for assistance in regaining control of his kingdom. Strabo records that in his absence, Egypt was ruled jointly by two women, Trephena and Berenice, but a duet act didn't cut it for Berenice. Trephena died that very year, possibly poisoned by her co-regent who then ascended to the throne as Berenice IV, sole queen of Egypt, at age 20. She was met with no resistance, her siblings too young to combat her, and the population content enough as long as there was a Ptolemy on the throne who wasn't engaging them in wars with other countries. However, her advisors fretted. Berenice refused all their suggestions to marry, wanting instead to choose for herself. Perhaps she was thinking of one of her namesakes, her Aunt Berenice III, who was also pressed into marriage and then was promptly killed by her cousin-husband. Perhaps she was not so eager to share power after having so recently gotten rid of her sororal baggage. Whatever the case was, her council eventually wore her down, and she conceded to marriage. Her groom was Prince Seleucid VII of the Seleucid Kingdom in Syria. Nobody was fond of Seleucus, who bore the nickname Kibiosaktes, meaning, essentially, he smells like tuna. Nobody included Berenice. She'd done the marriage, eased her council's worries, and with her queenly duty satisfied, she had her husband strangled. Berenice remained free and in charge for the next year, presiding over a peaceful Egypt while in Rome her father strategized ways to reclaim his throne. However, her counselors soon pleaded again for Berenice to marry, hoping for an heir to the throne and likely a co-ruler who would limit Berenice's rising royal expenditures on fashion and luxuries. In 56 BC, two years into her reign, Berenice was courted by a high priest of the temple state of Comana, Cappadocia, named Archelaus. He claimed to be the son of one of Rome's preeminent enemies, the deceased King Mithridates of Pontus, but historian Strabo said he was more likely a son of the king's general, another Archelaus. Whoever his father was, he had left Archelaus with enough military skill to impress Berenice's royal sensibilities, while the man himself wooed her personally with gifts. Finally, here was a man Berenice could choose and be content with. They married in 56 BC. Whether Archelaus was made co-regent is up for debate. Archelaus had been aided in his pursuit of Berenice by a close friend, Aulus Gabinius. 
unknownst to Archelaus or his new wife, Gabinius was also working in Rome with Ptolemy XII to take back his throne. In 55 BC, backed by Gabinius and a Roman army, Ptolemy returned to Egypt, engaging Archelaus and the Egyptians in battle. Archelaus fell, Ptolemy prevailed, and Berenice was dragged from her throne and subsequently beheaded. She was 22 years old. Archelaus' body was rescued from the battlefield by Mark Antony and buried with honors, but the traitor queen had no such luck. She is likely buried somewhere in Alexandria, the place of her birth and death, but Alexandria and the Ptolemaic dynasty was about to go through some serious turmoil, and much was lost forever in the aftermath. Ptolemy was back on his throne, a fact he owed entirely to Rome, but he wouldn't stay there for long. Four years after his return to power in 51 BC, Ptolemy XII died. He ordered that Egypt be left to his oldest son and daughter, half-siblings Ptolemy XIII and Cleopatra VII, and the two were subsequently married. This is historically accepted to have been a bad idea. At 17 to his 11, Cleopatra was much older than Ptolemy, ruling independently while he ruled via regent. She was also arguably much smarter and inarguably more savvy about politics than her little brother, and seized as much power as possible. Her face appeared on mints and her name on official documents where Ptolemy's was absent. This, understandably perhaps, upset Ptolemy XIII, who, like his sisters, was not fond of sharing power. He had her kicked out of Egypt like her father before her in 48 BC, chasing Cleopatra away to Syria where she immediately began to amass power and military forces to take her throne back. History was repeating, two Ptolemies fighting over the throne, and no one was paying attention to the third player in the room. Arsinoe was a bit of your typical middle child in the Ptolemy family. She was born somewhere between 68 to 63 BC to an unknown woman and Ptolemy XII. She might even have been Ptolemy XIII's twin. She was still very young when her sister Berenice took the throne and subsequently lost it, and likely was barely a teenager when her father died in 51 BC. The oldest she could have been when Cleopatra was exiled was 20, but most historians put her at around 17, if that. Like all of Ptolemy's children, she was incredibly ambitious and thirsty for power. With her royal brother and sister occupied, Arsinoe began to plan her own strike. It was during this time Julius Caesar would wade into the Egyptian succession crisis and try to restore order. He attempted to enforce the will of Ptolemy XII, ceding power over Egypt equally to the two eldest siblings, while at the same time trying to give Cyprus to Arsinoe and her younger brother, another Ptolemy. He had hoped the latter decision would remove the threat the younger siblings posed to the rest of their family, but it was a futile dream destined to go up in flames. Literally. See, the thing about constant squabbles and power grabs when you're dealing with countries is that after some time, things begin to splinter. The longer a foreign force stays, the more muddled the lines become. Generals get ambitious, armies change loyalties, people go native. Such was the case with the Gabiniani, a legion of Romans who derived their name from their leader, Gabinius. Remember him? The general who slew Archelaus and returned the throne to Ptolemy XII? Well, he himself had since perished, but the men he left behind were now utterly loyal to the son, Ptolemy XIII. At their head was Achilas, one of the generals who had slain Caesar's friend and fellow leader, Pompey. He took offense to Cleopatra and Caesar's continued presence in Egypt, and so the Gabiniani besieged the capital of Alexandria where they were staying in 48 BC, setting fire to large parts of the city and possibly burning up the library of Alexandria. It was in this turmoil that Arsinoe and her advisor, the eunuch Ganymedes, escaped from the capital and joined with Achilas' forces. In one swift move that her sister likely would have been proud of if it didn't threaten her own reign, Arsinoe now had 20,000 men at her disposal. An army. With armies came power, and with power came position. She named herself Arsinoe IV, Queen of Egypt in 48 BC. However, dissension would soon erupt between Achilas and Arsinoe, and she had him put to death in 47 BC. She placed herself in charge of the army, with Ganymedes as her right-hand man. Arsinoe persisted in the siege of Alexandria, ordering her men to wall up parts of the city and pouring seawater into the Roman army's cisterns, trapping them with nowhere to get fresh water. It was a pretty ingenious plan, causing enough panic in Caesar's troops that their leader had no choice but to fight for control of the harbor if he wanted any hope of finding fresh water sources. To control the harbor, one must control the lighthouse. The lighthouse, or Pharos of Alexandria, was a massive structure situated on the edge of a tiny island that ran right along Alexandria's coast. 
Caesar and his forces launched an attack meant to seize control of it, but the impossible happened. Arsinoe's forces drove him back. No, not just drove him back. Delivered to Caesar such a defeat that he was forced to cast aside his purple cloak and armor and flee the battlefield, swimming to a nearby Roman ship for rescue. It is said that Arsinoe took the purple cloak and flew it like a banner above the lighthouse after her victory. Things seemed to be going fantastically well for Arsinoe, but her army was dissatisfied, both with Ganymedes and the continued fighting. While Arsinoe dreamt of the victory within her grasp, her men negotiated with Caesar's forces to trade her for Ptolemy XIII. The trade was made, Arsinoe betrayed, and all of it essentially for nothing, as Ptolemy would be quickly defeated by Roman reinforcements and drown in the Nile that very same year. The roles had flipped. Cleopatra was the victorious queen and Arsinoe the hated captive. She was dragged off to Rome in 46 BC and made to take part in Caesar's triumph, a ritual celebration of his success. They paraded her in front of a burning effigy of the lighthouse, the symbol of her victory against Caesar. I can only imagine that proud girl, the jut of her chin, glaring up at that man and knowing that no matter what, she had made him kneel. But that's just my imagination. In reality, pride was possibly all Arsinoe had left. She was spared the fate of many prisoners after triumphs, strangulation, but was shipped off to the Temple of Artemis in Ephesus. In the next years, Caesar would fall, and Mark Antony would rise to power alongside Cleopatra. There is some evidence that Mark Antony tried to give control of Cyprus to both sisters at some point, but nothing came of it if true. By 41 BC, she and Cleopatra were the last Ptolemies left, after the murder of their youngest brother Ptolemy XIV at the Queen's hands. The sisters kept a watchful eye on each other, but Arsinoe was ultimately powerless. When Cleopatra went to Mark Antony and entreated him to execute Arsinoe, there was nothing she could do. He had her murdered on the steps of the temple, an act of blasphemy that shocked Rome. Arsinoe was likely at or around the same age her eldest sister Berenice was when she was killed, 22. She's probably buried at the temple, but her body has never been positively identified. A little over a decade later, Mark Antony would be dead, and Cleopatra would commit suicide when the new emperor, Octavian, threatened to have her march in his triumph, like Caesar had done with Arsinoe. When her son Caesarion was executed not long afterwards, the Ptolemy dynasty was finished. Egypt, the land Berenice and Arsinoe and all their siblings had fought so hard for, would now be in the hands of the Romans. It seems strange when you have the benefit of hindsight. 20 years of ambitious, scheming Ptolemy sisters and their power-hungry brothers, sororicide, fratricide, revolt, occupation, so much struggle, and it's all gone with the bite of a snake. Of course, we still remember a beautiful, cunning Cleopatra, but no one remembers her sisters, who she was so like and who were so like her, carving their crowns out of Egypt by force because they believed they deserved nothing less, a power that in the end, nothing but death could take from them. After death came nature to cover up their tombs, and after nature, time, to take away their memory. And the two queens fell into a relevancy in the larger picture of the last years of a dynasty. No one can find them now, but hopefully this has blown back a bit of that top coat of sand for you, chipped away at the first layer of names so that you can know some of the ones that lay hidden. Berenice and Arsinoe, the last queens, the lost fourths of Egypt. <laughs>